I mentioned a moment or two ago that as children we were afraid to go to the privy at night, remember? Well, we were justified. You see, invariably there were animals prowling around making all sorts of eerie noises. Hoot owls answering one another, foxes, raccoons, cats meowing, strange dogs barking and going through the woods, even skunks, but them we could smell. There was always rustling among the trees or the bushes or in back of the houses. Everywhere there were noises. Now, when the boys were older, they would hide and scare the younger ones, especially the girls. How I hated them. I had two older brothers and two younger ones. The older ones never missed an opportunity to give, especially my sisters and me, a good ghostly scare whenever they possibly could. I didn't describe the old homestead too well. There's much to say about it. Each of the kitchens had both a stairway leading upstairs and another going down to the cellar. The cellar had a dirt floor with big flat boulder type rocks here and there on which to place barrels of provisions, like barrels of pickles or homemade sauerkraut. Only the main part of the house had a basement. Under the two ends, or L's, as we called them, there was no open space. Being that the floor was a dirt floor and there were springs under the building, every year the cellar would be flooded. To keep the potatoes, apples, and other provisions from ruin, my Uncle John, my father's brother, and my father had to make platforms about two feet from the ground to put the things on. My mother preserved fruits, pickles, ketchup, berries, and other things for winter, so my father made shelves along the walls to place the jars on. My mother canned hundreds of quarts of fruits, each as it ripened during the summer. Summers were a very busy time for everyone, from the smallest to the biggest. Each was responsible for some phase of the work. I'll talk about that later. But I'd like to tell you now that when there was water in the cellar, in some spots, sometimes up to a foot in depth, and we had to get something from uh, there, we hopped from one rock to another to get it. It really was a problem we had to face each and every year. Uh, this situation was not ever present. It was especially prevalent during rainy seasons or in spring. Sometimes the basement was completely dry for months and months. Also, the cellar was very cold because there was no central heating. In the summertime, it was cool, but freezing in winter. As a very small child, oh, perhaps even as young as four years old, I can remember my father building out of boards along the whole front of the house a trough about 18 to 24 inches high, into which we put leaves. We used to go into the woods and collect huge burlap bags and bags and bags of leaves. We loved to do it because there were unending amounts of dry leaves under the trees to pick, to throw, and play around with as we filled these huge burlap bags. Then my dad would get the horse and the lumber wagon into which we piled the burlap bags of leaves, brought them home, and filled the framework around the house to keep cellar warm enough so that the potatoes, apples, and whatever else was there from freezing. We continued doing this until the trough was completely stomped down and filled. Needless to say, we enjoyed riding on top of these huge bags of leaves. In spring, the leaves in the trough were quite rotted and had to be removed. Also, the framework had to be removed. They were emptied into the manure piles in the barnyard and spread as fertilizer on the fields before plowing, harrowing, and planting. My father did this leaf job until he built the foundation of the house. He had to rebuild it. And he framed a porch completely around. Surprisingly enough, this porch kept the cellar from freezing. I made, uh, rather, 
I may add here that the contents of the privy likewise had to be removed and utilized. That also was plowed into the soil. Nothing was wasted. In reality, it had to be put somewhere. I can tell you that we grew the biggest and the sweetest watermelons in the neighborhood. People wondered how we got such huge melons. We didn't tell them. It was our secret. I'm going to take time out here to tell a watermelon story, which was not true, but very hurtful to us for a while. One year, I must have been about 10 years old at that time, my mother planted watermelons on a field next to our neighbor's farm. All the fields and farms were separated by stone fences built by people to clear the soil for planting. There was a young boy in that family, about 17 years old, who loved to jump over the fence at night to take a few watermelons now and then. To scare him off, we kids spread the word around that we put poison into some of the melons. It so happened that that boy, he worked in Montville about eight miles away, one day was so hot and sweaty walking home, took a swim in the ice water of a pond and got pneumonia. There were no wonderful antibiotics then as we have nowadays, 1986, and he died. Now, we never caught him taking the melons, but the family spread stories that he died because of our watermelons, that he was poisoned. That let the cat out of the bag as to who was doing the snitching. Of course, we never poisoned the melons. That would have been dangerous all around to ourselves as well as to anyone else. You see, we sold melons and even gave many away. We didn't plant just a few hills of melons. We planted probably a half to a whole acre. You see, we had over 100 acres of land, which included many acres of tillable soil and fields and so forth, as well as meadows and woods, etc.